So Antoine, as a co-host, you may decide either to be lenient and uh, let everybody in as they come in, even if they're late, or you can lock them out after 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> if, uh, you know, it's like in school. <laughs> no, no, I, I think we, we can admit people if, even if they are late, since they <laughs> disturb us by joining. <laughs> yeah. They have to produce a tardy. <laughs> Just, uh... But you give the start signal, uh, Mark, right? Yeah, so in one start minute, now. so it says just I'm keeping. Okay, so it's time, actually. Yeah, right. I think so. Yeah, very good. Okay, so um, uh, this is a, uh, uh, something you would have seen had the event uh, taken place live. Um, so please, during the presentation, make sure to turn your mic and your webcam off. And, um, and then, um, but you can use the, uh, the chat feature to, um, uh, to write questions that you have. And Antoine is going to be the, uh, the co-host. And uh, actually, he will have uh, total power to, uh, uh, to give uh, the uh, mic, to, uh, to unmute the, the mic of various people. So just uh, this now uh, familiar flyer. Of, um, of the Les uh, session. And um, again, let me uh, repeat. So here is the link to the uh, YouTube uh, channel where all the presentations but one so far have been uh, downloaded. So they're available already, uh, including Antoine's uh, two lectures. And, um, and then, um, we try to put them up uh, as closely to real time as possible. So without further ado, I will let uh, Antoine host the meeting. So let me just, okay. Yes, and I will stop my sharing. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. So uh, welcome. Uh, everybody to this uh, Thursday uh, afternoon local time uh, session of the Les uh, School. Uh, I'm Antoine Georges and I'm going to be the chair of this session and we are very fortunate today to have uh, Professor Divine Kuma uh, give the today's lecture. Let me tell you a few things about Divine. Uh, Divine uh, received his PhD uh, from the University of Michigan about 10 years ago and uh, he did a postdoc at the Center for Research uh, in Interface and Surface Phenomena at Yale University in the group of Charles Han. Uh, from this place on, he moved uh, to be a professor uh, at uh, North Carolina State University. And uh, the research and research achievements of Divine are exactly at the heart of the general theme of that school, because he's uh, one of uh, those uh, people who know how to grow uh, these uh, oxide and other materials, uh, thin films and heterostructures with atomic precision. I guess the core of his lab in particular is an MBA machine to, to grow these systems. And he of course doesn't only grow these systems, but he also studies them uh, physically, and uh, he has a number of uh, tools in his group, including uh, X-ray spectroscopy, uh, which he does at nearby synchrotrons, uh, atomic force microscopy, and so on, with uh, which he studies these materials. He has a number of uh, research, research achievements uh, on uh, oxide, thin film, and heterostructures, uh, the various types of functionalities and phenomena that I described also in my lectures in the previous two days. Um, and in particular, uh, he's been also uh, studying phenomena at the interface between uh, such uh, oxide systems. And so today he's going to present his lecture, which is going to last 90 minutes. Uh, the lecture will be followed by a question and answer session, which is supposed to uh, last a little less than half an hour. And I would encourage participants to actually put their questions as the lecture goes into the chat. I'll take a note of them 
and then we'll ask all the questions at the end of uh, Professor Kuma's lecture. So Divine, uh, the floor is now yours, or the screen is now yours. Please share your okay. screen. And sure. Can you lecture. make me a co-host um, and I will... Uh, yes. Uh, I know how to make you... No, I think you're fine. Okay, you can yeah. see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes. I think uh, you're already allowed. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Antoine, for the kind um, introduction. And thank you, Mark, and the organizers for the invitation to describe um, some of our work, uh, where we're working on trying to tailor the magnetic and electronic interactions which occur at complex oxide interfaces. All right, so a quick outline of my talk. I will um, very briefly introduce um, transition metal complex oxide materials. And um, we're going to be focusing on the interfaces, these um, materials have when we grow them as two-dimensional films and um, form interfaces with other um, complementary oxides. All right, and so in my talk today, I'm going to describe some routes by which we can tune the structural, electronic, and magnetic um, order parameters in these systems and interfaces. And I'll be focusing on two-dimensional films grown by molecular beam epitaxy. And so as Antoine mentioned, this allows us to synthesize high-quality oxide films with atomic scale precision and um, by changing the um, layering of these systems and by applying um, tools uh, which allow us to in, in change the strain states, we can also manipulate the ground state of these um, materials. The samples I'm going to be talking about will be characterized using a wide um, range of suite of um, techniques, uh, which will include um, squid, which measures the total um, magnetization of these systems, and um, synchrotron X-ray diffraction, which allows us to determine the sub with sub axon resolution the uh, structures of these ultra thin systems and their interfaces. And also X-ray, um, synchrotron X-ray spectroscopy, which allows us to, with ele element specificity, determine um, both the magnetic properties of these materials and also their uh, electronic uh, properties. And um, first principles theory, which also guides us in designing these interfaces and measuring, yeah, um, understanding their properties. All right, I'm going to focus on one particular system, um, which is the interface formed between the rare earth um, manganites and the rare earth chromates. And the goal here is to try and understand how we can stabilize ferromagnetism in atomically thin lanthanum strontium manganite um, thin films, and also um, use strain engineering to tune the orbital and magnetic um, orders in these materials um, by growing these heterostructures on substrates with different, uh, slightly different um, lattice constants. All right, so Antoine and uh, the other speakers gave a really good introduction to the um, perovskite um, transition metal oxide, and so I'm going to go through them um, very quickly here. All right, so the, um, the ideal perovskite structure um, looks like like what I've shown in this um, cartoon here, where you have a transition metal ion, which um, sits uh, and is surrounded by an octahedra of oxygen um, ions. And at the corners of this cube, um, these green atoms here are usually rare ions or group one or group two ions. And by changing the chemistry of this um, system, changing what transition metals we have or what rare earth ions we have at the A sites, we can obtain a very wide range of um, interesting physical uh, properties. So for example, if we have titanium in the center here, surrounded by oxygen and lead or barium at the corners here, we have materials like lead, like lead titanate and barium titanate, which are ferroelectric and are characterized by um, a displacement of the negatively charged oxygen ions relative to the positively charged ions, even in the absence of an electric field. I'm going to focus on um, magnetic oxides, and I'm going to be focusing on lanthanum strontium manganite, which um, at 30% strontium doping is ferromagnetic and metallic at room temperature. And I'm going to show that uh, we can tune the structure of ultra thin layers of lanthanum strontium manganite to modify the uh, magnetic ground states of these systems in epitaxial thin film systems. All right, so the way that structure is related to the other order, order parameters, the orbital, electronic, and, and uh, magnetic degrees of freedom in the systems, again, has been covered um, very well in Antoine's talk. Um, but we can start off by um, examining the ideal cubic um, perovskite structure where you have a transition metal ion, where, for example, a 3D transition metal ion like manganese, um, surrounded by oxygen ions here. 
And um, due to the crystal field, um, which um, arises from the coordination of the, or the coordination of this transition metal ion with the six oxygens. Um, that leads to breaking the degeneracy of the 3D EG orbitals into a lower energy T2G manifold and a high energy EG uh, manifold. And so just uh, from this perovskite structure, we have this um, difference in the orbital, um, breaking the orbital degeneracy of the 3D orbitals. And so one can then uh, go on to, um, to try and understand or predict how electrons will fill these um, shells in the perovskite structure. And so if we consider manganese 3 plus, which has um, four electrons in its D shell, the um, filling of these um, orbitals will be, will have to um, follow Hund's rules where the um, three electrons will fill the lower energy um, T2G orbitals and will have spins pointing in the same directions. And um, the EG orbital will have an electron, which will also point in the same direction due to the um, Hund's um, coupling between the T2G and EG states. We can tune the relative, we can further break the degeneracy of these orbitals uh, by inducing, uh, by either having antenna-like distortions or by applying biaxial strain, where if we, for example, if we apply biaxial strain to this ideal structure and we have a tetragonal um, symmetry where we have short transition metal oxygen bonds in plane and elongated bonds in the out of plane direction, that can lead to also further um, changes in the orbital um, energy, uh, the energies of the orbitals in the system. And so in this example here, Along the Z direction, because we have these elongated bonds, that leads to a reduction in the energies of the 3Z square minus R square orbitals, which point um, along the um, Z direction relative to the in-plane pointing orbitals. And if we now want to put that fourth electron in the manganese 3 plus um, in this, um, fill out the shells in, in this case, the electron in the EG shell is going to lie in the um, Z square minus R square orbital, which points in the out of plane direction. And so the ability to you know, modify, to induce um, very small changes to the structures of these um, materials can have very uh, significant impacts in the way the um, electrons um, fill the system and also in the way the orbitals um, order in the systems. And if we want to examine how the, um, the magnetism, uh, long range magnetism occurs in these systems, uh, we have to consider the fact that the magnetic moment of one um, Ion, one transition metal ion is coupled to the next transition metal ion by a bridging oxygen, um, uh, uh, a bridging oxygen uh, negatively charged ion. And so uh, the good enough canomery rules give us a set of um, principles by which we can predict whether the exchange or the super exchange is ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. And if we have the case where we have two um, transition metal ions, which are either half filled um, EG orbitals or, or empty, um, EG orbitals um, based on the, these set of rules. And the exchange in this case is anti-ferromagnetic. And if we have a situation for, for example, for multivalent systems where we have either, where we have um, a half-filled um, transition metal ion um, coupled to um, a transition metal ion with, for example, its EG orbitals completely empty. In this case, the exchange, uh, the super exchange here is um, going to be ferromagnetic. All right, there's a third kind of exchange. We can have uh, the double exchange, which will occur in material in, in Nigerian systems where electrons are free to uh, move up, up, about in the system. And in the, in the double exchange mechanism, for example, if we have a D4 um, coupled with an oxygen P and an, an, a D3 ion, the an electron can move from the oxygen to, the, um, to one of the um, transition metal ions. And this hopping here, um, is favorable if the spins have the same um, orientation. And so in this particular case, the double exchange mechanism will lead to ferromagnetic ordering. And it, um, is, it will depend also on the strength of this um, hopping, which will, is related to the overlap of the orbitals of the oxygen P and the transition metal D um, orbitals. And so in this cartoon here, we see that if we have the situation where the octahedra are not rotated, um, then the the um, overlap between these orbitals is large and the, uh, the bandwidth is large and the um, hopping or the uh, hopping is large. And so we'll expect there to be an increase in the double exchange and uh, increase in ferromagnetic ordering in the system. However, if we rotate these octahedra, that leads to a reduction in the um, overlap of the P orbitals and the, e and the um, transition metal D orbitals. And that would re result in a suppression of um, both um, the electron transfer and also of um, 
of the double exchange ferromagnetic interactions. So um, just to summarize, we can, you can use these octahedral tilts and rotations as a parameter by which we can tune the magnetic and electronic ground states of these transition metal uh, perovskites. All right, so this tuning is well known in bulk. And so if we, for example, examine the phase diagram of the rare earth nickelates, uh, where we can tune the octahedral rotations by changing the rare earth ion in the structure, which effectively changes the ionic radius here and the tolerance factor. We see that as we go from lanthanum nickelate, which has um, the largest ionic radii and the smallest distortions of this octahedra, um, lanthanum nickelate is metallic um, down to, uh, it has a metallic ground state. However, if we increase, sorry, however, if we decrease the ionic radii of the rare earth ion, for example, by replacing lanthanum with um, yttrium or europium, we see that that leads to an increase in the octahedral rotations and a decrease in the transition metal, oxygen transition metal bond angle away from 180 degrees. And the corresponding effect is a ground state, which is um, anti-ferromagnetic and insulating in this case. Uh, we can also play the same game of tuning these rotations in, in the manganite, where, for example, if we have um, a, a doped rare earth manganite, a whole doped rare earth, mag rare earth manganite, um, where A is a, a rare earth ion, which is trivalent, and A prime is a divalent um, ion. We can tune the relative sizes of the rare earth by changing the chemistry, changing what A and A prime ions we have in the system. And you can also see then as, that as we decrease the rare earth ionic radius, which also leads to an increase in this octahedral uh, distortions, that um, moves us from a ferromagnetic metallic um, ground state to a ferromagnetic insulating ground state. All right, so in the bulk materials, um, just by changing the, site, the size of the, of the A site, we do change the tolerance factor and we have a way by which we can tune magnetic and electronic ground states. Um, but we can also do this in thin films by growing these materials on substrate with either different octahedral rotation patterns or with slightly different um, lattice uh, parameters. And so for example, if you grow um, a film with um, some octahedral distortion on a substrate with a, a different um, rotation pattern, because the uh, material has to be coupled, the octahedra are coupled at that interface, that can also lead to uh, either suppression or enhancement of octahedral tilts and rotations in these um, atomic layer heterostructures. All right, so in addition to using strain and um, octahedral um, coupling at interfaces to modify the structures of ultra thin perovskite of, of perovskites um, in interfaces. Uh, one approach we can also use is taking advantage of the reconstructions which can occur at the polar at the interfaces between polar materials and non-polar uh, systems. And so a canonical example is a lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface where in the ionic limit um, lanthanum aluminate if we consider the formal charges of lanthanum aluminum and oxygen uh, can be viewed as alternating layers of positively charged and negatively charged sheets. And strontium titanate, if you also perform the same analysis, comprises of neutral charged uh, planes. And so at the interface between lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate, you do have a polar discontinuity. And if you compute what electrostatic potential will be in the LAO as a function of its thickness, you find out that the, this electrostatic potential is going to diverge um, if there is no reconstruction to alleviate this uh, interfacial polar discontinuity. And so there are a couple of mechanisms which can occur. You can have charge transfer, so the charge which can move from the lanthanum aluminate to this interface, or you can also have ion ionic um, intermixing where some of the divalent um, strontium and trivalent um, lanthanum um, move across that interface um, to alleviate this uh, polar discontinuity. And the net effect in the case of lanthanum aluminate on strontium titanate is that at that interface, you have a high mobility two-dimensional electron gas, which emerges with um, some fer with ferromagnetism and also superconductivity. And this is a situation where these um, reconstructions driven by the, the non-polar polar interface lead to interesting um, new properties. Um, but I'm going to focus on structural rearrangements which occur at these polar interfaces, and these have been seen and predicted in, for example, the lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface, where if you, um, so in, in this um, work um, here, it's shown that if you have, for example, a lanthanum aluminate film on strontium titanate, um, the, as a result of the polar interface here, that can also lead to a rampling of the negatively charged 
oxygen, oxygen ions relative to the uh, cation positions. So in the ideal um, lanthanum aluminate um, crystal, the, you do have octahedral rotations, but um, within the planes, the oxygens and aluminums occupy more or less the same Z position and there is no polar distortion. But here you can see very clearly that um, at these interfaces here, there is a, a, a rumpling of the oxygen and relative to the aluminum positions and also the oxygen re related to, to the lanthanum positions. And um, if you're able to induce this kind of polar distortions in another um, kind of transition metal ion, you are also transition metal perovskite system. The effect here is that you are effectively increasing the transition metal oxygen bond length and also distorting the bond angle um, between the transition metal, the oxygen, and the neighboring transition metal um, ion. In addition to these um, polar-like distortions, again, it's been observed that you can have this um, coupling of the oxygen of the hydride interface where um, strontium titanate, which has no rotations at room temperature, and lanthanum aluminate, which has octahedral tilts um, of about six degrees, um, can be, you can suppress the oxy octahedral rotations in lanthanum aluminate at that interface um, due to the fact that the octahedra are connected at that interface between the LAO and the STO. And so in this case, uh, you do have these polar distortions which are driven by the polar discontinuity and also these distortions of the oxygen octahedra, which are driven by the fact that the oxygen octahedra are connected at the, at the uh, hetero interface between lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. All right, so the question then is, can we use these polar discontinuities and, uh, as a way to tune the structure of ultra thin perovskite oxide films? And the idea here is that if you can induce a polar distortion in the material, again, you are effectively increasing the bond length and, the bond, and decreasing the bond angle between the um, transition metal ion, the bridging oxygen, and the neighboring transition metal ion. And the net effect is that you are reducing or you're tuning the orbital overlap here um, relative to what you should get in the ideal case. And uh, what I'm going to show in the rest of my talk is that indeed these polar distortions can do occur at a, a wide range of these oxide interfaces. And they're a very important mechanism by which we can tailor the uh, structure of these interfaces. And in the case of the lanthanum strontium manganite, this has a really great, a strong impact on the magnetic ordering in these um, in ultra thin lanthanum strontium magnite layers. All right, so LSMO, lanthanum strontium manganite, um, <clears throat> has been studied um, for quite a while in its bulk form and in the form of thin films. And um, in the LSMO um, structure crystal, you can change the whole um, concentration by increasing the amount of strontium, divalent strontium in the system. And what that effectively does, it changes the uh, ratio of the manganese three plus and manganese four plus um, in your uh, crystal structure. And so what is seen is that as you increase the lanthanum, sorry, the strontium um, doping, you go from a ground state, which is anti-ferromagnetic and insulating uh, into a ground state, uh, into a state which is ferromagnetic and metallic if your doping is somewhere between 20% and uh, close to 50% of uh, strontium. And uh, for LSMO with about a 30% strontium doping, there is a, there's a Q temperature which exists at about 350 Kelvin. And uh, room temperature, the material is a ferromagnetic metal which, and exhibits um, a very strong um, glossal magneto resistance. And there's a spin polarized half metal. And all of these properties are important in designing, for example, um, devices for um, Smintronic applications. And so what we like to do is take the LSMO films, which are well understood in the bulk form, and reduce their, their dimensions and study how changes in the structures of these ultra thin films uh, can affect the magnetic and uh, electronic ground states. All right, so the films are grown by um, molecular beam epitaxy, and uh, I think Daryl will be talking about um, MBE in some more detail later. Um, but what we essentially do have is a high um, vacuum, ultra high vacuum chamber in which we evaporate high purity metal sources. So for the growth of LSMO, we evaporate in lanthanum strontium and, man and uh, manganese. And uh, we calibrate the fluxes to obtain um, growth rate of about one um, unit cell per minute. So it's a very um, slow process, but this allows us to control the, both the stoichiometry and the crystallinity of these films with atomic scale precision. All right, so when we grow a very thick um, LSMO film on strontium titanate uh, single crystal substrates, um, we observe that 
for example, if we have a 30 unit cell thick lanthanum strontium manganite film, um, the, and we measure the magnetization as a function of temperature, the um, system is paramagnetic above 330 Kelvin, and below that, uh, we see that it becomes ferromagnetic with a saturation magnet magnetization of about 3.6 bar magneton per manganese, which is very close to what you should expect for bulk LSMO. And so here for very thick films, we see that the mag magnetization and also the transport are very similar to bulk and um, single LSMO crystals. However, if you reduce the film thickness, for example, by a factor of 10, we see that the magnetization is strongly suppressed and also the films at these thicknesses are um, insulating. And so this effect that we see for these films, LSMO films as a function of thickness, and have been known for quite a while in the community. And um, they're referred to as the dead layer effect, where it's known that if you grow, for example, LSMO films and measure the resistivity as a function of temperature and as a function of the film thickness, for films with thicknesses less than about 10 unit cells, they have um, insulating ground states. And also, as you reduce the film thickness and measure the magnetization as also as a function of temperature, you, you can see that the um, magnetization goes down and below about um, below five unit cells. So for a three unit cell thick film, the uh, film is completely dead magnetically. All right, so the conclusion here is that um, there is some something which is changing in these films, which is causing this um, change in both the electronic and magnetic um, properties. And we'd like to um, evaluate that um, by investigating the structures of these ultra thin LSMO films. Um, but before we do that, uh, we can also examine the stacking of these um, LSMO films and compare that with the, for example, the LAO STO case. And if we also compare the, by evaluate the net charges in the layers, um, ionic charges in, of the ions in all the layers of the LSMO along the 001 direction when we grow it on um, non-polar strontium titanate uh, substrates. We also see that the LSMO is, uh, can be considered in this case as a polar material because it has these um, negatively and positively charged alternating layers, whereas the strontium titanate is non-polar. So here we do see that there is an interface um, polar discontinuity. And if we also terminate the films with, for example, manganese oxide, then we also will have some net charge at the surface, which will lead to a polar discontinuity um, between the surface of the LSMO films and vacuum. All right, so <clears throat> the reconstructions which occur, um, so reconstructions also occur at the LSMO um, interfaces, and um, these have been studied for quite a while. And so in this um, excellent work, um, it was shown that, for example, if you have an LSMO film with grown strontium titanate, where there was no reconstruction to alleviate the polar discontinuity, you will also have a divergent electrostatic potential in the LSMO film as you increase its thickness. And uh, if this was, if the polar discontinuity, there was some reconstruction to alleviate this polar discontinuity, uh, that would lead to uh, a suppression of this, um, that, would, that would lead to this green um, electrostatic potential, which will not diverge as the LSMO thickness increases. So the approach which has been taken to kind of suppress this, um, reconstruction um, has involved um, quite a few, a few ways. And one of these um, approaches has been to insert a spacer layer at the LSMO interfaces. And the idea here is that you want to suppress some of the uh, reconstruction uh, mechanisms which lead to suppression in um, magnetism. And so in this particular case, um, the, what was seen here in, by studying LSMO STO superlattices was that um, the interfaces between lanthanum strontium manganite and strontium titanate was not atomically abrupt. And this was driven by lanthanum strontium um, exchange across the interface to compensate for the polar discontinuity. And um, by inserting a lanthanum strontium titanate layer uh, with a slightly different lanthanum strontium ratio, they were able to observe that the interfaces became more sharp and that also led to improvement in the magnetization of these ultra thin LSMO uh, films. And um, further studies have been done to investigate charge transfer across these interfaces where, for example, if you use um, EELS electron energy loss uh, spectroscopy to measure the charge states of LSMO and um, strontium titanate in LSMO STO superlattices, what they find is that, um, so in the titanate layers, so titanium should be in a four plus state, but they find that, that um, in um, heterostructures where you have everything STO um, with LSMO on either side, there is a very strong um, 
reduction in the well the 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 net chart on the on the, on the titaniums is um, strongly suppressed, um, which indicates that there is a transfer of um, in this case electrons from the LSM mode into the STO. And uh, as you increase the titanium STO thickness, you can see that the um, you get back to a four plus state. Um, but there's also a suppression of the, um, there's also a significant charge transfer which goes into the titanate layers very close to that interface. And so these are all examples of um, reconstructions which kind of care these um, interfaces. Uh, so here you can have intermixing and here you can have this charge transfer. And all of these um, in interactions lead to changes in the LSMO composition and structure of that interface, which um, cause the deviation in the magnetic ground state away from the expected ferromagnetic state. The other thing which can change at these interfaces are the oxygen octahedral um, tilts and um, rotations. And so, for example, if you go lanthanum strontium manganite, which has uh, in bulk um, rotations on strontium titanate, which has no rotations at room temperature, uh, what is seen from these um, analog dark field and bright field uh, microscope images are that the LSMO has significantly suppressed rotations close to that interface. And you can also induce rotations in the strontium titanate. Um, but um, in this particular case, since the rotations are suppressed in the LSMO layers of that interface, you, you will expect there to be enhanced, um, enhanced um, double exchange. However, these interfaces are still, um, not, still exhibit suppressed um, ferromagnetism, which implies that even though you are reducing the rotations, the effect of um, atomic intermixing and charge transfer at these interfaces um, counterbalances this expected enhancement leading to the suppression of uh, magnetism uh, for LSMO layers very close to the interfaces. Um, the, this work by Steve May's group also showed that um, you can actually, um, if you use an isovalent um, spacer layer like glanthrum calcium manganite, which has a different, um, a slightly um, smaller lattice um, octahedral tilt pattern as lanthanum strontium manganite, you can indeed suppress the LSMO rotations. And what you do find is that um, for this um, two unit cell LSMO, eight unit cell LSCO, uh, LCMO heterostructure, you can actually suppress the rotations in the LSMO and um, get an enhancement in the magnetization. All right, so just to summarize um, what I've talked about so far, we've seen that uh, interfaces between these complex oxide systems you can have structural distortions, you can have changes to the interface stoichiometry and charge transfer. And for LSMO, a lot of these mechanisms lead to the reduction in interfacial magnetization. And the open question then is whether you can design an appropriate spacer layer which will tailor the LSMO to enhance its magnetization in ultra thin um, LSMO, for, for ultra thin LSMO thicknesses. All right, and so to do that, uh, we'll first start off by uh, measuring the atomic scale structures of these ultra thin films using synchrotron X-ray diffraction. And uh, we're using synchrotron X-ray um, synchrotron X-rays as our, our X-ray sources because of the large, um, the high um, intensities we can get, um, which allow us to get um, good um, X-ray diffraction signals from these ultra thin uh, samples. And so in our experiment, we're interested in, in sampling three dimensions in reciprocal space along what are known as crystal truncation rods. And um, the idea here is that if you can measure in sample in three dimensions, the diffraction um, information about your sample, where you're measuring the interference of diffraction from your thin films and interfaces, whose structure you like to precisely know, and a substrate whose structure is usually um, very well characterized, you can, um, if, if you are able to recover the phases of the intensities that you measure, you can reconstruct um, by sim simply performing an inverse Fourier transform to get a three-dimensional um, electron density map, where in this electron density map, you can resolve in every single layer with sub-angstrom resolution, the atomic positions and the compositions of your material. All right, and so the um, details about this um, technique um, can be found in, the, in these references, but I'm just going to talk about the results that we get using this method to image the structures of thin lanthanum strontium manganite films. All right, so here we studied the structure of a 10 unit cell thick lanthanum strontium manganite film known as strontium titanate, and, um, which is 001 oriented. And um, what we see here is um, what I'm plotting here 
uh, in the first um, panel here is the lattice, um, the spacings of the of the uh, unit cells along the z direction um, as a function of the distance from the LA LSMO SCO interface. And so what we see here is that um, there is this increase in the lattice um, spacing when we are very close to that interface, and then it goes down to the expected um, value for for this um, degree of strain. And the top layers of the LSMO films have this um, again this strong um, dilation in the lattice parameter in the outer plane direction. Um, the other thing we find from this um, structural analysis is that um, the, at the surfaces of these films, there is a very strong polar distortion, which involves the displacement of the manganese ions here upwards relative to the oxygen sublattice. So I should just um, remind you that in, in bulk LSMO and in bulk STO, there are, there are no polar distortions. And even though you have these octahedral tilts and rotations, on average, the um, cations and anions occupy the same plane and there, there, there is no in, intraplane uh, polar uh, dipole form. However, we find that there is this strong ground plane which occurs at the surface of the LSMO films, which we can characterize by this delta here, which is a difference in the Z position of the manganese ion and the average of the oxygen ions. And um, the plot here shows how this um, delta, um, this polar distortion um, evolves with the LSMO um, distance from the STO LSMO interface. So at, at the surface of these films, we see that these polar distortions are very large. And um, so for the first one, two, three unit cells of the LSMO going from the surface downwards, uh, we have this really strong polar round planes occurring um, both in the um, manganese oxygen planes and in the lanthanum strontium oxygen planes. And by the time we get about um, three unit cells below the surface, the distortions go to zero. Um, but as we approach the interface with the strontium titanate, we find out that the distortions emerge again and um, they, um, they are maximum when we are right in contact with the STO interface. And um, if we, we can also, from our electron density maps, extract the composition as a function of layer. And here we also see that there was significant intermixing which occurs between lanthanum and strontium at that interface. And the net effect of all these interactions are that, for example, especially for the polar distortions, are that we are at the surface of these films because of this uh, polar rampling decreasing the orbital overlap between the oxygen p orbitals and the uh, manganese um, eg orbitals and that um, should suppress suppress double exchange interactions and um, enhance the anti-ferromagnetism anti in the layers of these lsmo films close to the top surface and um, due to these distortions and the change in stoichiometry at the interface at the two unit cells uh, close to this interface we should also expect um, that the interface layers will also have a strong suppression in the ferromagnetic ordering and uh, in conductivity. However, if you grow a film which is larger than this um, interface um, thickness, you now have layers in between which are far enough away from the surface and far enough away from the interface that you have um, expected, um, you have no polar distortions and the expected stoichiometry. And we can also measure these bond angles inside these layers here. And we find that these bond angles are very close to what we should expect for bulk LSMO systems. All right, so just to summarize again on this uh, section, we see that um, in, if the, idea, the, the structure of the LSMO films, uh, the surfaces and interfaces are strongly distorted away from the ideal structures, and we think these are driven by the polar discontinuities, which occur both at the bottom interface with strontium titanate and then the top interface uh, due to the termination of the uh, films um, with um, and um, if in the, we, we can now view um, these LSMO films as, as having three distinct regions, a surface um, of about two to three unit cells with these strong polar distortions and an interface, which is also distorted both um, in structure and in composition. And um, there could also be um, electron transfer across this interface, which uh, we can probe using electron energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, but more importantly, we have these layers in between, which are far enough from these interfaces, which have bulk-like structures and bulk-like compositions. And that's where, th these are the section of the films which are ferromagnetic and metallic in these uh, systems. All right, and so here I'm showing the magnetization we, we can measure for a two unit cell thick LSMO on strontium titanate, where the structure of this LSMO film is strongly dominated by these polar distortions. And uh, you can see here that it's, um, the mag mag magnetism is strongly suppressed, even down to, um, in this case, down to um, 2 Kelvin. 
And so the approach here we'd like to take is to modify the interface and the surface of these ultra thin LSMO films to hopefully suppress these polar distortions and uh, recover bulk like structures. And um, this approach, um, as I mentioned before, has been used uh, using different kinds of space layers. Uh, for example, LSTO, lanthanum strontium titanate has been used, lanthanum strontium ferrite has also been used. And um, the general idea is that you want to have a space layer which has the, a similar charge um, stuck in as the LSMO and also uh, have similar octahedral um, distortions and uh, rotations as the LSMO so that you're not inducing significant changes to the rotations of the octahedral close to that interface. And so what we're using is some lanthanum strontium chromate where we keep the lanthanum strontium ratio in the chromate layers um, the same as the LSMO film so we can have this balanced matching at that interface. And um, the, the LSCO, lanthanum strontium chromate has some other um, important um, qualities which make it an ideal space layers for um, these LSMO heterostructures. So in bulk LSCO, it's um, anti-ferromagnetic um, even up to the 30% doping um, level that we are using in these LSMO LSU heterostructures. So we do not expect um, a significant contribution of the magnetism in the LSCO um, to um, contribute to the total magnetization of these samples. But I, I will show that this is actually not true and that there's a very strong um, exchange which occurs at the interface between the LSCO and the LSMO, which leads to a different um, magnetic um, configuration. Um, we can, as I mentioned, also tune the lanthanum strontium ratio of the LSEO to match the LSMO so that we can um, balance match um, that interface and remove the polar discontinuity. And um, LSEO is lattice match to LSMO. It has a very sim similar to the cubic lattice constant. So we do not expect any additional strain to be introduced into the system. And uh, also importantly, the fact that the octahedra uh, distortions or rotations in the LSEO are very similar to that of LSMO. So we know that we're not going to be tuning the LSCO, LSMO rotations too far away from their bulk-like um, values. Uh, but the other important point here, um, which um, makes the LSCO spaces um, very different from some of the other spaces which have been tried, is that um, we find out that there is a strong suppression in the interfacial charge transfer. Uh, so we don't have, um, like I showed for the STO um, S LSMO case, um, elect a large uh, number of electrons or holes moving across that interface to dope the LSMO layers away from the optimal doping. All right, so this is a cartoon of what the structure is going to look like that we're going to study. So we're going to have our LSMO um, film with some uh, with n unit cells ranging from two to ten unit cells, and uh, we're going to have lanthanum strontium chromate layers inserted at the interface between the LSMO and the STO, and also one at the top because we've seen from the structures of these thin films that the surface and the interface are important in, uh, in, in well, have significant distortions uh, due to the polar discontinuities which exist at these regions. And so these films, these heterostructures, uh, these trilayers are grown using molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, we can get um, really smooth surfaces and um, good ex, um, electron diffraction images, which are um, indicative of two-dimensional growth and um, what we like to do now is compare the atomic structures of ultra thin LSMO films. So, so a four unit cell thick lanthanum strontium magnite film with a lanthanum strontium magnite film where we have the lanthanum strontium chromate spaces on the top and bottom interfaces. And the question we'd like to answer is whether we are indeed removing the polar distortions, which I've um, shown are possibly driven by the polar discontinuities at the surfaces and the interfaces. All right, so the plot on the left shows the, um, the, the image here shows a, a cut to the electron density profile of a four unit cell thick lanthanum strontium manganite and strontium titanate. And this cut is showing the oxygen and the manganese and the oxygen and titanium ions in, in, across that interface. And so we see that at the topmost manganese oxide layers, the oxygen sublattice, oxygen ions are displaced downwards relative to the manganese ions. And um, this delta here is, uh, this difference in the, this polar distortion is on the order of um, about a third of an angstrom. And as we move down towards the interface um, with the strontium titanate, we see that the distortions go to zero and then they become again more significant when we are directly close to the STO 
LSMO interface. So we'll expect, again, a reduction in the double exchange in this very thin LSMO films. And uh, we see that if we have our four unit cell thick LSMO, so these one, two, three, four layers here with the strontium, with the lanthanum strontium chromate on the top and the bottom interface, we do see now that the chromate layers at the surface have very strong polar um, distortions. However, uh, more importantly, we see that the LSMO layers in between here have um, zero distortions. So here we can confirm, we've been able to confirm that using this lanthanum strontium chromate spaces, we've been able to that we've been able to suppress the polar distortions which occur in these LSMO films. And um, the next thing we'd like to do is examine the effect of these spaces on the magnetic properties of the ultra thin layers. All right, and so um, the, a two unit cell thick LSMO film is magnetically dead. Uh, it has strong suppression in its mag magnetization. But we see now that when we add this lanthanum strontium chromate um, spaces to the top surface and the bottom um, interface of the lanthanum strontium magnetite film and create a 323 heterostructure where we have only two unit cells of lanthanum strontium manganite. We do observe that there is a non zero magnetic moment and a uh, Curie temperature which lies uh, somewhere around 150 Kelvin. So here we do see, um, just from a squid measurement, that um, the introduction of the LSEO spacer layer uh, is sufficient to induce. Um, to significantly modify the magnetic ordering in these ultra thin LSMO layers. And here we're able to demonstrate that uh, a two unit cell thick film is uh, possibly ferromagnetic. All right, but one thing we see is that as if we create these heterostructures where we keep the chromate space layer thickness fixed at three unit cells and vary the lanthanum strontium manganite thickness from two unit cells to three unit cells to six and 10 is that there is an increase in the magnetization of these heterostructures as we increase the LSMO thickness. And um, this magnetization is normalized to the number of manganese ions. And so we'll expect that if uh, the LSMO had bulk magnetism to uh, have a magnetization close to about 3.6 to 3.7 for magneto. Uh, but the fact that we see this um, thickness dependence here suggests either that we have some counted um, ferromagnetism in the system or we have um, a contribution to the mag magnetization from the lanthanum strontium chromate sub lattice. Um, but, and so it's, what, what, what we like to do now is probe the magnetism, not just using squid, which looks at the total um, chromate manganite uh, system, but um, use um, element specific um, X-ray uh, magnetic uh, probes to determine the magnetization in the chromate sub lattice relative to, uh, and separately from that of the manganese um, sub lattice in the lanthanum strontium manganite. And um, in this experiment, uh, what we do is we tune the X-ray uh, photon energy to match um, specific electronic transitions in our, our transition metal ion. And so in the case of our 3D um, ions, manganese and chromium, what we do is we tune the X-ray energy to excite transitions from the 2P um, core state into the unoccupied um, 3D states. And if we go in with a linearly polarized light and uh, we can measure the relative um, whole um, dense, uh, occupation, uh, density of states of um, orbitals with in-plane and out-of-plane symmetry. Um, but um, since we're interested in the magnetization, what we are doing is using a circularly polarized light where we can probe the relative density of states of um, uh, uh, the relative um, density of state of um, state with up spins and down spins. And by looking at the differences in these, um, these um, occupations, uh, we can get, an inform get information about both the spin uh, moment and the orbital moment of our uh, transition metal ions in our heterostructures. All right, so what we do find is that um, if we have, for example, a three unit cell LSMO film with the cr chromate on either side and we perform the, this um, XMCD measurement um, from about 600 to 665 electron volts, where we want to probe the manganese L edge. We do find that there's a difference in the absorption uh, for left and right circularly polarized light. And the difference here indicates that the spins in the manganese sub lattice are aligned in the same direction as the applied magnetic field. So in this experiment, we're using a half Tesla a magnetic field applied in plane. And those measurements were carried out at 15 Kelvin. And here we do see that indeed the manganese layers are ferromagnetically, uh, are ferromagnet in 
the, the, the strengths in um, the manganese layers are ferromagnetically um, aligned. And however, if we do the same experiment at the chromium L edge, so between 570 and 595 electron volts, um, as I mentioned before, bulk lanthanum selenium chromate is a G-type antiferromagnet. So we'd have expected there to be no dichroism at the chromium L edge. But in, what we do find is that um, the, there is a negative dichroism. So if we integrate this XMCD signal, it's negative. And we can also apply XMCD sound rules. And what we do find is that the mag magnet, the spins in the chromium sublattice are aligned anti-parallel to the applied magnetic field. All right, so the, we can think of the entire structure as being a ferry magnet system where we have um, positive magnetization in the LSMO sublattice and negative spins in the chromate sublattice. And this is driven by an, in, an exchange at the interface, an, a super exchange at the interface between the manganese ions and the chromium ions, which um, tends to be anti-ferromagnetic. All right, so we can also measure the um, XMCD signal at the chromium and manganese um, L, at, at the peaks of the chromium and manganese um, XMCD uh, signals. And we do see that um, in this case, they follow the same temperature dependence. And um, for this particular sample where we had six unit cells of the LSMO with three unit cells of the LSU on both sides, the QE temperature was close to 200 Kelvin, which is similar to what we see from our XMCD measurements. And so what this tells us is that the chromium mag magnetism is driven by the manganese uh, magnetism due to this interfacial antiferromagnetic uh, super exchange. And, um, and so what we, what theory ex um, predicts, um, uh, so we've performed first principles um, density functional theory uh, to determine what the um, moments of the chromate and manganese sublattices should be. And what the theory predicts is that the chromate um, spins should be anti-aligned with, uh, should be anti-aligned with the manganese spins and the uh, chromium moment should be close to 2.2 uh, 2 ball magneton per, chrom per chromate and the manganese should also be close to 3.4 ball mag uh, positive 3.4 ball magneton per manganese ions. All right, and so what this does is it explains why we have this um, thickness dependence of the magnetization as a function of the LSMO thickness if we keep the chromate um, space out thicknesses fixed. And the idea here is that the chromium spins have a uh, contributing um, negative, have a negative contribution to the total magnetization and as we increase the manganite thickness, we are increasing the amount of positive moments in our, in our ferromagnetic structures, which should um, lead to this um, increase in the magnetization as a function of the LSMO thickness. All right, but um, so what we wanted to do was to, um, in addition to the XMCD data, try and um, experimentally um, determine the manganese and chromium moments to confirm what the theory predictions were um, of the two negative two and uh, positive 3.4 ball magnetons uh, for the moments of chromium and manganese respectively. And so to do this, um, instead of using our tri-layer heterostructures, we decided we went on to create these super lattice samples where we kept the chromate layers fixed at two unit cells and uh, vary the thickness of the LSMO layers. And the uh, rationale here is that um, we can in a super lattice structure, we can reduce the contribution to the total magnetization of the LSCO layers at the surface and the interface, which we've seen from our structural measurements are distorted away from, from the bulk uh, structure. And so the idea here is that if we do measure in squared the total magnetization normalized to the LSMO, um, the number of manganese ions in our heterostructure, uh, so I'm going to call that M star, that is going to be equal to the chromium moments multiplied by this ratio of the chromate thickness to the manganite thickness plus a constant. And this constant here is going to be the manganese, uh, the moments per manganese ion. All right, and so we can grow these materials um, also with atomic scale of precision. The yields maps of these um, systems show that there's a uniform distribution of, for example, strontium through the system, lanthanum through the system, and there is some intermixing at the interface between the STO and the LSCO which will definitely, which is similar to what we should expect um, in the LSMO STO interface driven by the polar discontinuity. Um, but we can, uh, as the, in this super lattice, we, and in this case, this is a two three super lattice, we can very clearly see um, that the chromium sub lattice is separated from the 
manganese sublattice. So there's um, limited chromium manganese um, exchange um, ionic intermixing at these interfaces. Um, and so if we compare, first of, if we first of all compare the magnetization just as a function of the ratio of the chromate to manganite, what we found is that this, uh, the magnetization only depends on the chromate manganite ratio. And so if we grow a super lattice with one unit cell of lanthanum strontium chromate and two unit cells of lanthanum strontium manganite and um, another super lattice of two LSCO4 LSMO, in this case, the ratio of LSCO to LSMO in both cases is one to two. And what we find is that the magnetization of these samples are the same, uh, which indicates that the total, the QE temperature and the um, saturation magnetization are just dependent on the ratio of the manganese and the chromium um, contributions to the um, total heterostructure. All right, and so now if we go on to um, perform an experiment where we keep the chromate thickness fixed and vary the lanthanum strontium manganite thickness. Um, then we can now have um, uh, a plot of the of M star, this total squared magnetization normalized to the normalized to the LSMO thickness as a function of the chromate um, manganite um, thickness ratio. And um, sure enough, as we expect, um, this data follows uh, has a linear relationship where the slope is negative. And so remember that the slope here gives us the chromium moment. And we do measure a slope here, which is of about 2.1 bar magneton per, I'm sorry, per chromium, which is um, consistent with what the theory predicts. And we also find that, that the intercept of this line here is um, about 3.4 bar magneton per manganese, which implies that the manganese ions in, this, in these heterostructures all have um, individual moments of uh, 3.4 bar magneton, which is what is expected for strained um, bulk lanthanum strontium manganite. All right, so the next question or the obvious question is why the, trying to understand why the exchange between the chromate and manganite layers is um, antiferromagnetic in nature since the spins are anti-aligned. And we can understand that by going back to the beginning of this talk where I um, talked about how the orbital um, ordrin in these um, perovskite systems can be modified by epitaxial strain and how the exchange also depends on the relative um, filling of the orbitals, which are coupled by the oxygen virgin ions. So when we grow these heterostructures on strontium titanate, we have tensile strain since strontium titanate has a slightly larger lattice constant than the um, LSMO and LSCO layers. And so in this case, the strain is about 1% um, tensile strain where we are going to be stretching the LSMO bonds in plane and reducing the bonds um, in the outer plane direction. And uh, what we do see, or what we do expect, um, again, is that um, we'll, in this case, for tensile strain, we'll be lowering the energies of the x square minus y square eg orbitals, which point in plane along the elongated um, bond directions. And we'll be reducing or contracting and raising up the energy of the z square minus r square orbitals, which point um, in the vertical direction. And so right at that interface with the LSCO, we're going to have a coupling between an empty manganese um, three plus and four plus Z square minus R square orbitals and empty chromium um, orbitals and Z square minus R square orbitals. And um, based on the good enough Kanomori um, rules, because we're looking at coupling between empty orbitals, the exchange in this case has to be anti-ferromagnetic. And if we look in plane, we considering the exchange uh, between the manganese three plus and manganese four plus ions in the LSMO films. Um, so here we're looking at the exchange between this x square minus y square orbital, which is half filled in the in the uh, in the MN three plus, and also the manganese four plus ions, which have unfilled um, orbitals, um, x square minus y square orbitals. And based on the good enough Kanomori rules, we expect this. Um, interaction and also on the, um, the double exchange interactions, we expect this interaction here to be ferromagnetic in nature. All right, so the next thing we'd like to do is evaluate the effect of strain uh, on both the magnetic ground states of these systems and also the orbital, um, the ordering of the orbitals in these um, heterostructures. And so what I've talked about so far is a situation where we've grown these heterostructures on strontium titanate, which, where we have the C over A ratio 
uh, of about 0.985 and then about a 1% tensile strain. And uh, we can also grade these materials on LSAT substrates where the lattice parameter of the LSAT substrate is very close to the bulk LSMO. And so in this case, we have about a 0.2% compressive strain. And uh, we can also grade these materials on lanthanum aluminate, which has a relatively large uh, mismatch between the films and the substrates here, where we have about a 2% um, compressive strain in the LSMO LSEO heterostructures. Divine, I just want to say that uh, you have still 15 minutes to go for the lecture. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, I, I. Yeah, I said something wrong at the beginning. This is 75 I, minutes plus yes. five, right? Sorry about that. No, no worries. I planned for 75, so we'll be right on time. Okay. All right, so the idea here now is to play around with a pitaxial strain by, by growing these materials in different substrates. And uh, we're able to do that um, successfully growing them uh, using synchrotron, uh, sorry, using um, molecular beam epitaxy. And um, we can confirm that indeed there's a change in the in-plane and out-of-plane, um, the, the C over A ratio using X-ray diffraction. And so even for the highly strained um, heterostructures on lanthanum aluminate, we do find that, that the in-plane lattice uh, constant of the LSMO, LSCO matches the LAO. So we do have um, a pitaxial um, strain, um, coherent strain in these heterostructures. And uh, we also find that the lattice constant, the C over A um, does change when we change the substrate on which we grow these um, heterostructures. All right, so now I'm going to talk about how the magnetism changes uh, as a function of strain. And so what we see here is that if we create super lattice heterostructures where we have two unit cells of LSMO and two unit cells of lanthanum strontium manganite uh, repeated um, 10 times in these heterostructures um, that independent of the strain state of the film, so whether we grow them on STO, LSAT, or LAO, the films have um, non-zero moments. Uh, the films have a, a net moment at, uh, and are not ma magnetically dead. So here we see that um, independent of the strain, we're still able to alleviate the, de the problem of dead, ma magnetic dead layers. Um, but if we now zoom in on the saturation magnetization at, uh, for the 2-2 heterostructures, we do see that there's a slight change in the total moments as, um, as we change the magnitude of the strain from, coming from the, um, the substrate. And this difference is amplified when we increase the LSMO thickness. And so if we now keep the LSCO fixed at two unit cells, and double the lanthanum strontium manganite thickness, we do see that um, the moment of the net moment on LAO is significantly lower. So it's less than two bar magneton per manganese compared with the moments that we find for STO and um, LSAT. And so here we do see that there is a change in the total magnetization of these heterostructures, which is dependent on the amplitude of the strain exerted by the substrate. And uh, I guess what's most significant is that you can see for the 2-4 super lattice sample here, um, it barely has a different, um, it, it has a magnetization which is very similar to that of the 2-2 um, sample on lanthanum aluminate. All right, so we wanted to predict that the coupling of the spins to, to, to first and predict what the coupling of the, um, the exchange of the spins at the interface between LSMO and LSEO will be in these heterostructures on the samples with different strains. And um, this plot here shows the uh, calculated energies of the different, uh, for different configuration, spin configurations of a two LSEO, two LSMO heterostructure compressed um, to match the um, lanthanum aluminate um, strain. And so we do see that um, the highest energy corresponds to one where we have this um, antiferromagnetic ordering in both the LSMO and the LSEO state. And the minimum energy configuration is one where we have um, the LSMO being ferromagnetic and the LSEO having the spins in the same direction, but there being an antiferromagnetic coupling between the LSMO layers and the LSEO uh, layers in the super lattice. And um, very close in energy is a state where we have the spins in the chromate and the manganite aligned in the same direction. And um, one can envision an experiment where you induce some change to the structure or some change to the system where you can go back and forth between 
state A and state B, which are only separated by about 21 milli electron uh, volts. All right, and so uh, we can confirm that um, the reduction in the magnetization that we find for where we increase the manganite thickness um, is related to a decrease in the magnetization in the LSMO sublattice. And we can do this using XMCD measurements where we compare, for example, two, two super lattices grown on STO and LAO, which are very similar squared mag magnetizations with um, two, four heterostructures grown on STO and LAO, where we do see an increase in the mag magnetization on, for, for, the, for the manganese sublattice on um, STO and no increase in the mag magnetization for the um, LAO sublattice. Whereas if we do the same experiment, looking at the chromium L edges, we do see that the chromium spins do not change sig significantly as we increase the LSMO um, thickness. All right, and so what we'd like to understand now is why the LAO strain has this, um, even though it's, um, it has a net moment, it's not mag magnetically dead. We want to understand why there's this suppression and its magnetism. And we can do this um, by trying to understand how the orbital ordering will also affect the magnetic ordering in these systems. And so the general prediction is that if we have um, no strain in the system or we have very small strain, which we get when we go to films on LSAT, um, that the X square minus Y square and Z square minus R square orbitals will be um, almost doubly degenerate. And the in exchange in these system, there'll be strong double exchange and the net um, magnetic ordering here should be strongly ferromagnetic. And that explains why on LSAT, where we have the least amount of strain, we do observe a much larger um, value of the magnetization. Whereas in the case of um, strontium titanate, where we do have um, a small amount of tensile strain, about 1% tensile strain, there is now competition between the anti A-type anti-ferromagnetism and the ferromagnetism, which should lead to a slight reduction in the total magnetization of the heterostructures on strontium titanate. Um, the third case we have is where we have um, compressive strain on lanthanum aluminate. And uh, in the case of compressive strain, we are going to be elongating the bonds in the outer plane direction. And this will lead to ferromagnetic coupling along the Z direction and anti-ferromagnetic um, coupling along the um, in-plane um, directions. And this is a C-type AFM um, ordering which is um, expected for, LAO, for LSMO films, which are compressively strained to um, lanthanum aluminate. And so what we do see here is that um, the strengths of these antiferromagnetic um, interactions um, tend to be proportional, tend to get larger as you increase the magnitude of the strain. And that explains why we have this suppressed magnetism in the lanthanum aluminate system because of the um, of the increased um, C-type antiferromagnetism coupling inside of LSMO, which should increase as we increase the LSMO um, thickness. All right, by the fact that we do see that all the films are ferromagnetic, will have a net uh, moment at, for the very thin layers, has to do with the fact that the exchange interactions between chromium and manganese are the main principal mechanism which stabilize this um, ferromagnetism, this, um, net um, moment for the ultra thin layers. And as we increase the LSMO thickness, and uh, th then we have to now um, take into account the L LSMO, LSMO exchange interactions, which um, lead to this um, differences at, uh, for higher manganite thicknesses. All right, so we can also confirm that we are indeed changing the relative energies of the um, EG orbitals in the LSMO as, of, as we change the strain. And we can do this using X-ray linear dichroism measurements where we look at, measure the differences in the absorption using a linearly polarized light where we change the orientation of the uh, polarization of the uh, X-ray photons to lie in plane and out of plane. And what we are uh, doing in this case is looking at the difference in the whole occupations of the in plane line orbitals, which would be the X square minus Y square orbital and the out of plane um, pointing Z square minus R square orbital. Uh, and so just as expected, when we do this experiment at the, for the heterostructures grown on strontium titanate, the dichroism is negative, which implies that the, um, there is a smaller hole occupation, so a larger electron occupation in the in-plane line X square minus Y square orbitals. 
And as we go to the compressively strained samples, we do see that we are starting to have um, more holes inside the, the in-plane orbitals leading to a positive um, dichroism. And so we think that this um, dichroism here shows that the orbital polarization here is um, the orbital ordering in, orbital polarization in this case, it's what is driving the different magnetic ground states of these systems as we increase the manganite thickness. Again, which should explain why we have these differences in magnetization or different um, manganite thicknesses with different strains. All right, so I've hopefully shown that we can use, by choosing appropriate um, interfacial uh, spatial layers, we can manipulate the structure and um, of these ultra thin transition metal oxides to obtain a desired uh, functional property. And um, these two review papers um, cover uh, different other um, ways by which we can tune the, the properties of um, oxides and interfaces, uh, either by defect engineering, by symmetry breaking, by uh, formal polarization where we um, change the kind of ions and ch charges of ions we have in our systems, um, or by, as I've mentioned in my talk today, using strain engineering and um, coupling octahedra to modify the structures of these um, ultra thin layers. Uh, and so there are um, other ways by which we can do, we can modify these layers dynamically. And so if you have some means of um, inducing structural changes um, on short time scales using light, or by changing both doping and also structure using uh, external electric fields, for instance, where you make ferroelectric um, magnetic um, heterostructures. Um, these are all ways by which we can um, tune or tailor um, in a dynamic way the physical properties of these um, ultra thin systems. All right, so just to conclude, I hope I've shown you that um, we think that or we believe that these polar distortions uh, play a significant role in uh, modulating the magnetic um, properties of these ultra thin um, manganite um, films. And uh, by using an appropriate spacer layer where we can um, suppress the polar discontinuity and also suppress some um, changes to the local structures of these ultra thin layers, we can recover bulk like um, magnetic properties in these ultra thin films. And uh, we can also modulate the, uh, uh, tune the orbital ordering in these systems um, by using a pitaxial strain. All right, so uh, just last few words. We, um, these, um, this, kind of, this system here enables us to show that there's indeed a very strong uh, interplay between structure at the atomic scale and electronic and magnetic properties. And it, it does have important implications for the design of optimized complex oxide materials. All right, so with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and I will um, take any questions if there are any. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Divine, for a very nice presentation. And um, we now have the opportunity from a uh, Few questions uh, right now in the talk in the chat. I see only one, so time to ask more questions now. Uh, the best way is to actually write your questions in the chat, and I repeat the questions. You can also use the raise hand tool. So the question I have here is from uh, Ruby Kim, uh, and it's uh, saying the following th thing: Have you also performed electrical transport? on the LSCO, LSMO, LSCO heterostructures? Uh, yes, we have done some transport measurements. And so what we do find is that uh, for the two, two cases, so the case of two unit cells of LSMO, um, the films are still insulating. And one thing we're trying to understand is whether this insulating state now is driven by confinement. Um, but we do find that um, we do get metallicity in films as thin as um, four and five unit cells and as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there, there is a difference in the critical thickness for transport and um, magnetic um, dead layers. And so the fact that we do see the same difference even for the magnetically alive layers um, implies that there's some other mechanisms which might be dri driving the insulating 
states of the autofan auto films. Okay, uh, Ruby, uh, are you satisfied with uh, this answer? I'm going to unmute you if you, uh, I'll ask you to unmute if you want to ask more. Oh, yes, all right. Yes, I am satisfied. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question from Sichao Wang. Um, for LSMO and STO, you described that there are three layers of LSMO. If you built LSMO and STO super lattices, do you expect the three layers of LSMO that can be repeated after a few cycles? Um. I'm going to un ask for to unmute Chichao. So that... Yes. Can you clarify? Sorry, I, I missed the. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question uh, actually, uh, we have some uh, experiments on the uh, RSMO uh, with uh, uh, STO superlattice on the STO substrate. Yes. And then uh, we, uh, as you described that there are different layers like uh, 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 the dead layer and then the uh, uh, distortion uh, of uh, uh, oxygen of uh, distortion layer and then some layer uh, on the top should be really weird. I'm wondering if we, uh, and then we build a super lattice with this uh, kind of uh, layers and uh, we see this distortion can be repeated in the RSMO in the second layer, a second cycle and a third cycle, but uh, with uh, more cycles, like for example, the five cycles, we start to lose these uh, features. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any explanation for that, why we start to lose this feature of the distortion in the RSMO layer, uh, single layers. Um. All right, so you're saying, um, so have a super lattice where you have STO, LSMO, and the distortions you're interested in are the polar distortions? Yes. All right, so we haven't um, studied um, super lattices of the LSMO, STO structures, but um, as I... showed earlier from TM images, you, you also have the distortions in the octahedral rotations at those interfaces. Yes. So, um, all right, let me. Actually, the quite, uh, quite a forward. So, I, are you asking if we can include LS, so have an LSMO, LSEO, LSMO super lattice? Is that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, no, we, we've not tried to do that, but, but I think um, that, that could be one. One thing we can try, we can include maybe STO layers with um, no, which will have no rotations and hopefully suppress the rotations in the manganite layers even further. Um, okay. if, yeah, and so as we've seen now, we've seen that a, a single layer of the LSCO is sufficient to suppress the dead layer effects. So we don't have to have three unicells of the LSCO. And so this can allow us to now couple to other um, substrates with other symmetries or other spacer layers in between. Uh, but okay. that's something we would like to try um, experimentally in the future. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a question from Andy Millis that I'm going to read, but I also unmuted Andy if he wants to comment more. Hi, Divine, wonderful talk. Two questions. Can you say a little more about the dead layers? Are they intrinsic or can we make them go away? And an open-ended question on something you didn't really mention. Can we change the charge and magnetic order by non-equilibrium drives, such as applied current or parallax uh, radiation. All right, so the first part of the question about the whether they are intrinsic. Um, so as we've seen, um, I believe the, at least with the LSEO, the, the, these dead layers are probably um, an extra, extrinsic effect. And by recovering the bulk-like structures, we're able to make the dead layers go away completely. Um, the electric dead layers might be an intrinsic um, issue, which um, again is also seen in, for example, the lanthanum nucleate, where two two super lattices are still um, insulating. 
And so there, there are confinement effects that you have to uh, worry about. And it would be nice to get a good calculation, DFT calculation, which can really predict the ground state um, electronic structures of these systems, uh, like DMFT, for instance. Um, so may I just amplify on that a little bit? Sure. You know, as you said, the, the, it's the, the electric dead layer is the, key, um, is the key open question, at least in my mind. And the thing which has always struck me is that basically strontium ruthenate, cubic strontium ruthenate, has essentially no dead layer. You can get it to be conducting down to one monolayer. And oh, oh. more or less everything else known to man or woman has at least a couple of unit cells dead layer. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, do we have any insight into what's special about strontium ruthenate? Because, you know, you start doing calculations and you can, for any particular material, you can find a particular explanation. Um, but, not off the top of my head. I, I, I right. have not studied strontium ruthenate in, in much yeah. detail. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of strontium ruthenate, for the ultra thin layers, um, there's also a possible change in the symmetry, mm -hmm. um, which um, so the tetragonal phase can be um, stabilized in ultra thin layers. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if, again, in, in this case, you are pushing the material into a state which is going to be metallic right. uh, to start with, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't right. the case for, for LSMO. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. Thanks. So, so that means, in, in summary, you think that the, the dead layer issue is still open and would be somewhat interesting to resolve. Um, yes. So one thing that we are interested in, or what we are trying to do now is, um, so we do see that at the interfaces here, there's a little bit of intermixing. It, it's much more, sub, it's more significantly suppressed than what we've seen from just LSMOS to yeah. And so it could just be that there is some disorder which is introduced at that interface. And uh, we are working very hard at trying to uh -huh. stop in that interface. And so it could be that it's just, um, it's still, it, it is really an intrinsic so it's an extrinsic effect, mm -hmm. which might be driven by just interfacial disorder. Great, thanks. Uh, but we'll let you know in a few few weeks, few months. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Pushpandra Gupta. How can one get antiferon magnetic phase of LSMO? Is there any critical parameter like minimum thickness of the layer? So the antiferromagnetic phase um, you can get by changing the lanthanum strontium ratio. But I'm going to try to um, Hello, sir. unmute. Here we go. Sir? Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, actually, uh, we, uh, if I have target of particular strontium thickness or strontium concentration of 0 0.6 or more, where uh, LSMO is antiferromagnetic. So if I want to deposit that uh, uh, film from this particular target, so what will be the minimum uh, parameter which I have to follow? Like, uh, uh, just like you mentioned that LSMO ferromagnetic, if I want to deposit, then if uh, thickness is more than four unit cell, then it has enhanced uh, ferromagnetic property. Otherwise, uh, ferromagnetic will be suppressed. So similar way, is there any other critical parameter which we need to follow to uh, uh, to get antiferromagnetic phase? Uh, to get ultra-thin antiferromagnetic films? Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so definitely changing the, so, so right now I'm talking about a 30% doping where the ground state is um, ferromagnetic. Um, so changing the doping there should hopefully push you into um, the antiferromagnetic um, ground state of the LSMO. Um, the other thing that I, you can do is, um, all right, so if you're going to try and use spacer layers, then you want to choose a spacer layer in this case, um, where the exchange uh, between the manganese is also antiferromagnetic and the exchange between the manganese and the transition metal across that interface um, it's also, well, it could be ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic, but um, you'll have to play around with the choice of both the doping of the manganite and the choice of the spacer layer, so the doping of the spacer layers, where you can, in, in, in the long run, stabilize the net antiferromagnetic um, configuration of the systems. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, more right. questions? Uh, Does Andy anybody have more questions? So Andy had a question about also driving uh, dynamically changing. Oh yes, absolutely. Let me uh, unmute Andy again. Okay. I didn't have muted him, absolutely. So this was just a very open-ended question. And I know that this has not been the primary subject of your work, but right. just you demonstrated all this control over charge orbital and magnetic orders. And then the question is, are there good systems for moving that around by non-equilibrium means? Uh, yes, there are lots of ways by which you can do that. And um, I think, um, I don't know if Andrea is going to be talking about um, using light to modify the well, uh, I doubt if he doesn't. You doubt if he doesn't, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that is something definitely of interest um, to us. And so in this case, we have a ferry magnetic system, right? And so, mm -hmm. We can think of um, definitely pumping in with light and seeing what happens uh, to the magnetic ground state, uh, which is something that um, we've seen recently in, in uh, Cavalieri's um, in, in DSA's Ankit's paper. Of um, I right. what, yeah, it was a non-oxide, but this is, a, I think, a perfect system for carrying those kinds of measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you know, in particular, because as you said. Um, you know, the orbital order comes with substantial lattice distortions. The question is, is there some kind of odd parity phonon that you can talk to with light that would Correct. rearrange the uh, orbital order? Exactly. And, um, and definitely, I, I do think um, this, for example, for the 2% compressive strain, we, where you have these two ground states, which are very close. Right. Uh, you, you should definitely see a really large change in the magnetization if you are able to push it in the correct yep. direction. And, and so one thing I would like to examine from our DFT results is how different these structures are, the atomic structures are. And if there's some phonon you can push um, to drive the system right. from one state to the other. Yeah, great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see any other uh, question in the chat. Maybe just to conclude, I would ask you some, uh, uh, you know, broadband question, uh, Divine. Yeah. Um, so you've demonstrated in this uh, lecture, uh, beautiful control of magnetic properties. Uh, what would be the next uh, dream goal you would like to achieve in terms of control of either magnetism or perhaps other properties in those kind of systems? Um, we, well, there's always a question of superconductivity and its thickness dependence. Uh, that's something we might uh, look at in the future. Um, but for this particular subsystem, our next goal is just the dynamic control. So trying to couple this with photoelectric uh, materials and see. All right, so in, in the initial work where they've tried to induce um, changes to the properties of for example, manganites um, coupled with um, ferroelectrics. Uh, it's well known that this interface, this problem, this change is you know, confined to the interfaces of these materials. So one of our ideas here is that if you not, and now have a film thickness, which is on the order of the thickness of an interface, then we should expect a really large, uh, almost 100% switching of magnetization if you're able to um, correctly couple the both the structure and the electron and hole occupation of these systems to um, a ferroelectric um, spatial layers. All right, so uh, our next step is dynamic control in this particular system, uh, but we're also interested in a wide range of other complex oxides where um, there are thickness dependent transitions which might be related to these polar modes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, I think we should uh, thank Divine uh, for a beautiful lecture and close the session. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Divine, wonderful talk.